Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today we've got another gun gripe episode for you. All right, this one's a doozy. We're going to be discussing Senate Bill 4718, a piece of legislation that's been introduced by Diane Feinstein. Now the legislation itself is, uh, you know, it's been on the docket for a little while. We are going to discuss why it's pertinent. Uh, before we do though, I'd like to give a quick shout out and thanks to our friends at Everest. Uh, they are a great online marketplace that is uh, pro-liberty, pro-2A, uh, really good people. They're trying to offer sort of some competition for places like Amazon. So think of it uh, as a marketplace similar to Amazon, but pro-freedom, uh, pro okay? Uh, they have their Caliber program, which is really awesome. You can become an uh, Everest Caliber member, and you get really great deals on shipping, in some cases free shipping, uh, very similar to something like Prime. Uh, you get early bird specials, uh, early notices on products getting uh, arriving and things like that, all kinds of great perks. Um, they've got some wonderful content that they produce that you get exclusive access to their uh, back end of content, really good stuff, and some great content creators over there. Check them out, become a Caliber member, use the code IRECVET, and uh, you will receive $30 off a year membership. Ooh, boy. Which is awesome. We all love saving money. That's a tank of gas, baby. All right. We're, yeah, it is. So we're going to get into uh, this particular concept. And I would also like to just quickly, as a as sort of a baseline announcement for the channel, make sure you're following the Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit podcast as well. Uh, we put out our podcast every Friday. Matt and I at Ballistic Inc. does the t-shirts. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Uh, but make sure you're checking out our podcast. We work very hard to put that out, and we've had some awesome guests on it. So check it out. All right, so let's get into this. And the reason that it's important, now it hasn't even gone to committee yet or made it through committee or even been heard by, you know, it it's, hasn't even been heard. It's on only it. been introduced. It's and been this introduced. Is, this was back in like September when this bill was, was put on the docket. Yes. But yeah, the, uh, let's see, what's it called? 4718. The Stopping the Fraudulent Sales of Firearms Act. Dun, dun, dun! There we go. Um, so, Ammo Land put out a, a good article on this, and the, the, the short point is um, this is a warm-up effort that is already being hailed by the gun prohibition lobby as a way to place restrictions on perfectly legal businesses and even publications that deal or discuss online firearm and ammunition sales. So the biggest crux with this, this rewording of nine, the, the part of the code like 922 um, is that selling or advertising ammunitions or firearms online or through online publications or just through like paper publications uh, could be made unlawful. All right. So we already know Joe Biden, all right, he wants to ban the online sales of ammunition and firearms in general, uh, which it, it's always strange because, you know, the, these politicians, they think that, okay, you can go online and buy a gun and have it shipped right to you. That's not the case. They're ignorant to the fact that there are, you know, policies and rules and regulations in place, you know, that firearms have to go to a licensed dealer. They have to be transferred on a, on a form, 4473. Background checks have to be completed. The whole nine yards. But they still praise, like, these universal background checks and stuff all the time to um, pretty much eliminate the private transfer of firearms from an individual to an individual. And this is just basically stacking on top of that to eliminate the possibility of, you know, ammunition being advertised to you for purchase. So if you don't know about it, then you can't buy it. So it's another way to chip chip away at the block. I mean, so to speak. So Correct. But, and right here in Georgia, you know, we are amidst a very uh, you know, engaging runoff. battle here uh, on the Senate runoff. Oh, uh, so right now, you know, we, we've got two Senate seats in play, uh, David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler, mm -hmm. uh, both pro-2A candidates, very good people that have promised to toe the line uh, of 2A. And we'll have to hold their feet to the fire. And we will sure hold their feet to the fire. Make sure they, they uphold those promises. Yes. Yes, of course, we will hold their feet to the fire in that endeavor, but it's important we re-elect them because we want to make sure, um, you know, that those Senate seats do not flip blue. And the reason that this gripe is where it is and the reason that it's important, even though this bill hasn't gone anywhere yet, is that all these people are saying, oh, well, there's only so much that Biden can do or that he will do in regards to Second Amendment legislation, anti-gun legislation, as we would see it. Uh, but this shows that there is language clearly already in place. It's already been at least drafted and ready to drop at the moment's notice of a Biden administration uh, coming into play here. So yeah. 
what uh, the, the scary part about that is, is not only is the intention there, but now the, the actual language is there. Oh, and there'll be a lot more coming down the pipeline too, if that does come And there will play. be a lot more. So yeah. uh, they've already um, expressed interest, even though they won't admit it, but th they've definitely expressed interest in stacking the Supreme Court. So if we lose these two Senate seats, it certainly is gonna be a negative uh, connotation to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, Firearms Policy Coalition uh, which is a group of people I graciously support, and you should try your best to donate a few bucks to support them in their efforts. They are handing lawsuits out like candy. Lawsuit printer goes burr. Yes, it goes burr. <laughs> and, uh, and guys, that printer costs money to keep running, and oh, yeah. their efforts cost money, but uh, they are doing great work, and they are handing out lawsuits like candy, a few of which are actually going to make it to the Supreme Court, are gonna be heard by the Supreme Court. So it's exciting news to see a situation where 2A cases are finally, you know, have the potential to be heard by the Supreme Court and will be heard by yeah. the Supreme Court. And it's a very exciting time to hope that we can get some long lost rights restored. You know, that little chip off the block might get glued back on and might hold up for a while. So <laughs> it, it is a slow and painful death by a thousand paper cuts that is being attempted against us as gun owners. And it's been happening my entire life. Mm -hmm. I'm 36 years old, and as long as I've been alive, uh, I've, I've seen the gradual chipping away of our rights. And it's a very scary situation, right? And this could potentially put many, many, many gun uh, retailers out of business, right? Um, when we look at, I, I know we've discussed it in previous videos where we've talked about censorship. Okay, and in the censorship, we've talked about the fact that, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, you know, all of these large social media assets have become sort of a town hall for people to gather and share ideas, right? YouTube, even, just this video platform I'm on is such an integral part of our everyday life. People entertain their children on YouTube. People pull up cooking videos on YouTube. Oh, crap, something messed up on my truck. How do I fix this? I YouTube it. Bam, there's a video on how to fix your truck, your motorcycle, whatever, right? YouTube has become such an ingrained part of our everyday life that it is exactly a town hall type of situation. So much in the way from a censorship and freedom of speech standpoint uh, that these, these social media platforms have become such a town hall for us, the internet as a utility and as an entity has also become not only a town hall, but a institution by which we normalize our business practices in that manner, right? So it's clear to say that the internet is a widely accepted and used manner for businesses to conduct uh, business. And what this bill aims to do is to push firearms companies, or let's just say retailers of firearms or marketplaces for firearms out of the online uh, sphere, which would greatly hinder their ability not only to market or sell, but it would also make the availability of those items and the obtainability of those items and the ease of purchase of those items considerably more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yep. Not to mention putting thousands of people out of work. Absolutely. We don't like uh, you know people being on the unemployment docket. Um, to elaborate a little bit on this whole situation, um, as you know, at this point, okay, the runoffs have not occurred yet. All right? We're in December of 2020 currently. Um, if the if the two seats here in Georgia are lost to um, Warnock and Ossoff, all right, that will make a tie in the Senate, all right. And if uh, if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris do wind up actually becoming the sitting president and vice president of the United States of America, okay, Kamala after, will be the tiebreaker. Kamala will be the tiebreaker. The vice president is the tiebreaker in a Senate tie, okay? So we have to think about, all right, if this legislation does go into the Senate, and if it is voted uh, on across party lines, okay, so you have every single Republican, and uh, you know they vote against it, of course, all right, and you have every single Democrat they vote for it, then Kamala will be the tiebreaker. But as we've seen throughout recent memory, uh, a lot of a lot of gun rights uh, legislation and anti-gun legislation that's come through, we see people crossing over party lines. We see some Democrats supporting pro-gun legislation because of the districts that they work in, uh, especially like in the House. Okay, you may you may be a, a representative in the House, and your district. 
might be more conservative leaning when it comes to 2A rights, and you might be more of a pro-gun candidate, but you're you're more of a like social democrat and such, and that's what you run under the banner of the Democrats. Uh, so it's not to say that everything always just happens right across party lines, um, but the the potential is there, okay, for this to end badly for gun owners uh, with any legislation they put down. Uh, as we saw in Virginia, you know, people fought long and hard to keep anti-gun legislation out of Virginia under Northam. Uh, however, you know, everything that occurred, all the rallies and all the uh, the money that flowed into Virginia to fight these anti-gun pieces of legislation that came down, the only thing that really got defeated was the proposed assault weapons ban. But it got it taken off the table, and that was the most damning bill of all. Uh, so people's actions and, and their phone calls and emails and everything and just showing up for rallies and stuff, it really does make a difference. Um, but, like I said, the potential is there for this to end badly. Uh, if, if things are voted on party lines and Kamala does you know, tie break uh, some of these pieces of legislation, it, it can be, be bad. And we know, of course, that Biden will sign it into law. Of course. Oh, absolutely. He's not going to veto a, a you know a piece of anti-gun absolutely. legislation because he's already promised to do so much against the Second Amendment. And we say this in, in many videos, guys, but you know we're not trying to politicize the 2A. It's just one particular side of the table wants to politicize our constitutional right you know, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the preservation of our, our, our lives, this you know, safety of ourselves and our family and our communities um, by trying to ban commonly used items uh, that are used on a regular basis for personal protection, personal defense, um, and as it's laid out in the Constitution. I mean, we've said it before, all right? The Second Amendment isn't just for muskets, just as the, the, the First Amendment isn't just for written word or, or spoken word. Uh, you know, things change with the times, okay? So if you're going to say that the Second Amendment doesn't encompass AR-15s and AK-47s and so-called assault rifles, okay, uh, commonly used tools, all right, in this country, then you have to agree that, you know, the internet and other forms of digital communication are not covered under the First Amendment and freedom of speech. Uh, you know, you can't be that hypocritical, all right? Um, and when the Second Amendment was written, hunting was a was a part of life, a way and, of life. It was a, an accepted thing that people did, and it, it didn't need clarification. No, right? Not so all, all these people that say so, the Second Amendment's about hunting are yeah. full of crap. It has nothing so to do with hunting the, at all. The same arms that were used for civil defense, okay, of life or, or uh, you know personal civil defense and civil defense of the country, uh, were the same tools that were used. Uh, not only for hunting and such, but also the same tools that were used by the military organizations of the time. So the, the argument, the, the argument is, is null and void, but we still have it all the time because right. of the politici politicization of our rights and we're having to constantly be you know, on the defense. We, we can never be on the offense. We thought we were going to be on the offense for a little while, but that, that turned out to be you know, uh, null and void as well. And feel, we talk about that all the time, and we want we, we like to let the Republicans and Paul Ryan and everybody else know that they did not get the job done, and Trump included. He did not get the job right. done in the two years that we had full control of the ship. We certainly did not get anything we wanted in that, and I feel like it's also worth mentioning um, that when you look at the 94 crime bill, all right, which Joe Biden was an architect of, very much one so. of the architects of, the major architect, uh, when the crime bill went <gasps> through... A what, lot of Democrats uh, got sent up the river right after it made a lot of people angry. Yep. And there was a, one of the largest flips in mm -hmm. seats in like the last hundred years of our country as a result of that crime bill. Yep. And the after Democrats the have not forgotten that. Okay, I'm not saying be complacent. I'm not saying don't get out and vote in the runoffs. If you're in Georgia, you should certainly do that. Um, but what I am saying is that they might be a little bit on notice politically because they know how much of a hot button uh, item the Second Amendment is both amongst Democrats and mm. Republicans. Yeah. And I think that they know, they remember the heat of the 94 crime bill, and they know that if they push too hard, they're going to definitely flip even more. Mm. Not a single uh, House member lost, there was not a single House seat lost in the 2020 election. Okay, no, no red red seat flipped to blue in the 2020 election, and they know that. They look at all the statistics. They look at the house seats that that, that lost from blue to red in this election, and they look at the, some of the seat, Senate seats didn't flip too crazy in either direction. But but Nancy Pelosi is definitely angry 
at the amount of house seats that were lost. I think there the may have been election. there may have been one or two house seats that were flipped, but the net gain uh, was way more than Nancy Pelosi thought there was going to be for the the Republican side of that. Correct. Um, so they know they so. already seen the ramifications of these crazy decisions that they try to shove down people's throats. Mm. So they're on notice politically, even just by uh, the fact of how we vote, how mm. these elections turn out. And believe me, they see the results of that. Mm. So I'm not saying get complacent and don't do anything. Don't contact your reps. Don't keep an eye on this. But also understand, as Chad said, that there are votes that occur across party lines. And by keeping these two Senate seats here in Georgia, that just gives us a little bit of a buffer, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I just think it's important to remember, right, that, you know, these gun bills can certainly make it through the House and, and could make it through the House, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there could be some fence-sitting Democrats that would vote nay on this type of a bill just like there could be some rhinos that, that would vote, vote yay yeah, yeah on on uh, on a piece of anti-gun legislation yeah um one thing too to consider which the the data is going to come out on this matter in the in the coming years i mean there's no there's no immediate data that's going to be available for this this fact that i'm going to lay out here okay but the nssf put out a report okay recently and it's estimated that of all the, the firearm sales that have occurred in 2020, which has been breaking records like crazy, okay? And continues to. And continues to, even into this month. Um, there are an estimated 9 million new gun owners, okay, that had never had a firearm before, okay? New gun purchasers. And of those 9 million, 40% were women. Of that 9 million, 50% were black, you know, okay? or non-white, but mostly what the report I read said, 50% or so, 52% were black purchasers, you know, men and women. All right, so how yeah. many how many of those people uh, out there are, I guess the term could be ignorant to the, uh, to the Second Amendment as a whole, and you know, now that they are a gun owner, the attacks that come from the left in relation to them owning that particular firearm, they feel whatever the it might be. So, those people, those 9 million people, they may or may not be, uh, well, a lot of them may need to be definitely educated uh, in the advocacy that you know needs to be put out there for the Second Amendment and uh, the preservation of our rights. That's 9 million new people that can call their representatives if they live in, in more democratic strongholds, and they can express their concern over anti-gun legislation, but they need to know how to do it. So they, I mean... Videos like this and other videos, like if you know somebody who purchased a firearm uh, for the first time ever, share these videos with them. Share other people's videos and, and teach them about advocacy and the importance of it and the defense that we have to be on all the time concerning our, you know, our God-given right. And those 9 million people can also talk to a couple of other people they know, and yep. we can turn 9 million new gun owners into 18 million new gun owners, right? So you become the advocate, you become the ambassador to, you know, gun ownership, right? Someone, you know, now you're that person, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that not everybody wants to take on a responsibility of being like, okay, in your job, right? You know, maybe you don't work at a job where it's it's socially acceptable to discuss guns at the workplace, right? Or maybe you're worried that if you mention guns to your coworkers that they're gonna, you know, go talk to your boss and get you fired or something because you, they know your boss is anti-gun or something. So there are professional uh, consequences that people are maybe aren't willing to take. And especially now with all this stuff going on, I can certainly understand if you've got a job and you're being paid well, or you're making a living not wanting to disrupt that balance within the family unit. I get it. But there is a a principle-based, you know, action that we must take. And it is certainly our duty uh, to make sure that all our fellow Americans know that they have the right to protect themselves and that self-preservation is one of our most essential and God-given rights that we have, right? Yeah. It, it is the most fundamental human right on this entire planet. It transcends the Constitution. This isn't about America. This is about what's right and decent for human beings in this world, right? And, and the more and more you look at the way things happen around the world and all these terrible things that happen, you know, those things can come here. We're not immune to people trying to hurt us in our country, right? So no matter what your worldview is, no matter um, how politically engaged you may or may not be, no matter what side of the political stratum you may exist on or if, if you're not political at all, the right to bear arms is not political. <clears throat> 
it is simply a right that you can choose to uh, use or not. Uh, but those rights are not granted by man, and they can't be taken by man. And that's one of the most distinctive things to consider. So when you've got, you know, Feinstein and Pelosi's of the world and sure, AOC's of the world so. and, the, and, yeah, and, and Biden and, and Harris and all these people wanting to take your rights, you really have to ask yourself, what's the motivation for why someone like that would want to take away one of the most distinctive and important basic human rights that there is is to self-preservation. So mm. maybe think about it like that and the answer will be there for you. It's definitely not in the vein of public safety. No. It's in the vein of elitism and control. It has always so. been about control. Yeah. And nothing more. And you know they don't want you to be able to protect yourselves. They want to have a monopoly on violence. They want to have a monopoly on information. Mm -hmm. They want to have a monopoly on you. Yep. They want you to be a freaking tax slave, and we're going to not get into that, but yep. they want you to be a subject, not a citizen. They're two distinct hmm. differences, and uh, just keep that in mind, yep. guys. Uh, we want to talk about <clears throat> this. Th this could, could cost thousands of American jobs. It could cost millions upon millions of dollars in potential tax revenue, hmm. uh, which... I, you know, I'm not going to get into how I feel about taxes, but uh, the government is certainly making some cheddar off of all of those sales. So slightly, you know, um, one thing I want to hit on before we close it out is sure. uh, what you mentioned about the monopoly on information and such. Well, I'd like to think that a lot of the country is going through somewhat of a co cultural renaissance. Okay, with everything that's been going on, like when we we talked about this before in other videos, but early on in the coronavirus pandemic. Ah, ah, uh, did you hear that? Okay, so the pandemic. China. China. All right, the pandemic. All right, people started getting back to, to roots, like, okay, well, I, I'm not able to go out or whatever. We're locked down, you know, two weeks to stop the curve or, you know, stop the, the uh, what, stump the curve. What do they call it? Two, two weeks, weeks to, to slow the curve. Slow the curve, yeah. Um, flatten the curve. Flatten the curve. Flatten the curve. That's what Fauci said. Flat. Oh, we got to flatten the curve. Okay, yeah. Oh, oh boy. Um, <laughs> but uh, we saw it when we talked about our self-reliance video about gardening and canning and stuff. You know, people went like back to making gardens. Okay, planting seeds, trying to grow food and and get a little bit more self-reliant. Okay. Um, well, folks are trying to get more self-reliant in their information as well. Uh, they're relying less on mainstream outlets and the counterculture outlets, the more conservative and libertarian counterculture outlets like Daily Wire, Newsmax, uh, Town Hall. Yeah. Uh, I mean, countless others have been growing exponentially. Yeah, okay. Washington Free Beacon. Yeah, definitely so, one of so them. these outlets have been growing like crazy. You see social media apps like Parler, okay, growing like crazy, okay. Because, We're on Parler, by the way. Yeah, so they're censorship Shameless free. Shameless plug. Um, but I'd like to think that, okay, there's an information revolution going on right now, and people, like I said, going away from mainstream outlets that just, that literally just repeat the narrative. I mean, there's, there's videos out there showing the same story being broadcast across multiple news outlets all across the country, and it is word for word scripted, okay? It is propaganda directed to brainwash the American public, okay, and to keep everybody on the same page of misinformation in a lot of cases. But you see this growth of, of counterculture outlets, okay? So people are, are in a sort of an information renaissance. I'd like to think that people are in a, maybe a... Waking uh, up. Yeah, waking up and, and kind of in a renaissance of, hey, you know, the Second Amendment is a very important right, okay? My right to self-preservation, everything that's going on in the world, I need a firearm to protect mine and my own. Um, and... and I'd like to think that there's a little bit of a renaissance happening with that sort of mentality, getting back to those sort of feelings of patriotism and just, <clears throat> I'm an American and this is what we do and I'm not going to let anybody, you know, come and threaten me or mine. Before, Maybe. before Maybe. we leave, I would just like to also just add, no, you're thought. right, you're absolutely right. And before we leave, I would just also like to add to that, while the politicians choose to politicize the Second Amendment, I think what we're seeing is there are more and more people that are refusing to allow their rights to be politicized. And they expect, the politicians expect that the people are willing to play ball and that it's some glorious talking point that they can cram down their constituents' throats. And I think they're finding they're getting a lot more pushback on the Second Amendment, and that's great. 
And I'll add also to what you mentioned about the informational renaissance. Uh, it is true. Okay, when you look at, I think when you look at social media as it was 10 to 12 years ago, like we've been on YouTube 13 years now. When you look at the sphere of, of that and how it's expanded over the last 13 years, I don't think that the creators of these platforms realized how influential many of the people on those platforms would become in the in the coming years. And they see a clear and present danger in individuals like us who are completely independent and free of the mainstream media system having a voice to tell the truth. Mm. And when you see people like us censored, when you see a shadow banned, I mean, like on Facebook, we're extremely shadow banned. We've seen about an 87% decrease in traffic mm. on our Facebook page that is completely algorithmic <laughs> because it yep. occurred literally like the day after the election. And mysterious. So that tells you that they're, they're purposely throttling what yeah. we're doing in an attempt to silence us. And, you know, mysteriously, folks will go on Facebook and say, hey, I was unsubscribed from your page. Correct. Or, you know, I, you know, I was automatically unfriended or whatever the Correct. case is so there's algorithmic things that are going on in the back end yes. to kind of keep you in your place that's why we haven't seen our followers increase in the past what six years on, on been, facebook yeah we've been just stuck yes. in the same place mr gunsinger the, is going through the same thing absolutely the reason that i bring it up and the reason i feel it's pertinent to this video and pertinent to what you said is because the social media companies are scrambling to come up with a way to silence us without officially doing it mm -hmm. And that's why they don't want to just water. say, all right, let's 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 just take these people off our platform. Yeah. It's that simple, right? We can just do that, right? But they understand the political crisis that would be created by just completely removing conservatives from their platform and removing people that are essentially a dissenting voice to the narrative. Mm -hmm. So the way they do it is by removing you without removing you. And they do that through algorithmic destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many things that I could discuss that I won't. Um, but there's a lot of things they can do on the back end to algorithmically blacklist you. Yeah. And it's certainly happened to us. But anyway, yeah. uh, guys, have a great day. We really appreciate you tuning in to today's Gun Gripe. Uh, check out Everest. Great group of people. Uh, become a Caliber member. I did. It's awesome. You get this cool little care package, which is awesome. Uh, you get like a coin and a shirt, hat, all kind of cool stuff as well. And remember to use the code IRACVET to get 30 bucks off on your first year. Thank you very much for the support. We appreciate all of our Patreon supporters so very much. And all the folks who purchase t-shirts over on Ballistic Inc. And Ding. over on our website, Iraq Veteran 8888, and pick yourself up man cans, cutlery, all kind of cool stuff that we sell. So there's lots of ways to support the channel if you wish to support us directly. Have a great day. We'll see you next time. See you guys.